Welcome back to The Break Room, I'm Eric Voss, and Day Clone Tyrone is an amazing film that is on Netflix that you have to watch right now. It's a modern black exploitation film starring John Boyega, Jamie Foxx, and Tiona Paris that is brilliantly satirical and just as cutting a sci-fi social commentary as some of Jordan Peele's best works. It's directed by a friend of mine from college named Joelle Taylor, who in this video I actually had a very interesting interview with. But if you want to watch our Easter egg breakdown of this, Jessica Clements did an amazing analysis over on the main new Rockstars channel, so check that out. But this video right here on The Break Room is just going to be my unfiltered interview with Joelle. We have received guidance from sag that entertainment journalists like new rock stars are allowed to cover movies and TV shows like this the way that we do, and interviewing the director of the film about their vision for the film is totally okay. So without further ado, my interview with the very talented Joelle Taylor. We're talking with the amazingly talented director of They Clone Tyrone, and uh, someone who has made a number of films you might have loved over the past few years, but someone I know as a close friend from college at U University of Florida. Go Gators, Joel Taylor. Welcome to the show. How you doing, man? What's up, man? I missed you, man. I missed you. You know what I'm saying? It's been too long. You know what I'm saying? I've been watching from afar, man, and admiring what y'all got going on. I couldn't believe it the first time I, I saw your face on the on the thumbnail and had to do the double take, scroll back up, you know. So I mean, I'm, I appreciate y'all y'all hitting me up, man. It's good to see you, man. I'm glad we could finally do this. I mean, if, for us, it's the same thing. Like just seeing your name show up in uh, in like Deadline articles. Like, wait, Joel Taylor, I know that guy. Uh, or for like seeing your name show up in Creed Two, written by or, or Space Jam Legacy. I'm like, ah, oh, yes, he is doing it. That's so great. <laughs> Just to give all our viewers a sense of background, Joel and I did improv together at the University of Florida. We were part of a long form team called the Sunday Group, uh, part of the Theater Strike Force Group. And we had to do these, they, we had a dress code on this team where we had to wear ties uh -oh. and none of us were comfortable dressing yeah. this way I don't own, in the Florida heat. I don't heat. own a suit anymore, really. I have, <laughs> I, have, I have one button up dress shirt and two pairs of pants and I lost my dress shoes. So I, I think that was a re allergic reaction to theater strike force <laughs> fair fair absolutely fair because like and what you can't the pictures don't do it justice but like the type of improv that we did in florida was very physical we just had like our friend max on this team the guy would like jump on our backs in every scene and so to do that wearing dress shoes i don't know how we didn't break our ankles doing yeah, improv it was, that way. It was, it was, uh, it was definitely, and they were, they were like long form sets. So each set was like yeah. 20, 30 minutes or something like that. We were doing Harold. Yeah, yeah. And so <laughs> we were on there for a lot. We were sweating. Like it was just, <laughs> nah, man, it wasn't, that wasn't the deal. There's some, there's some, probably some picture somebody got somewhere of us all like climbing on top of each other. I'm just sure sweating. Just sweating. sweating. Yeah, nah, <laughs> Ruining our ties. But the reason I bring this up for everyone is, that was my experience watching They Clone Tyrone, a movie I adore because all I could think of while I was watching it was like, it's like doing an improv scene with Jewel because you got a mix of like, bit of Matrix conspiracy theory, you got some Scooby-Doo stuff, you got some hijinks. And I feel like four out of five scenes with you, Jewel, you'd come in and just like put your hand on my shoulder and whisper like, you know they're putting shit in the food, right? <laughs> like, so I was like, this is Jewel. This is Jewel in a nutshell. So like, I, I gotta ask you, how long has this idea been sitting with you? I mean, we we were sitting on the idea for a while, man. Like, I think we, it's kind of a circuitous route to getting made. I gotta shout out a couple of execs, like, you know, Brian Smiley, a uh, friend of mine, you know, like Kevin Hart and um, buddy Josh McLaughlin, who used to work uh, for Focus back in the day. They, they um, really wanted me to like, sit down and do it on spec and like come pitch it and we had the idea for maybe like a year or two before we pitched it just it wasn't like a concrete version of the idea it was just the idea of like the scooby-doo movie where like these detectives who weren't equipped solving a mystery and we knew that the detectives were going to be some kind of ne'er-do-well of some sort but it wasn't even like locked in that they were like the drug dealer the pimp the prostitute and so it took a little coercing to get us to pitch it without a script. So we, we pitched it in 2018. Um, and so we set it up in 2018. So we had been sitting on it for maybe 2016, 2017. Once we were invited to pitch it, we started like really like making it, you know, making it something that made somewhat of, some kind of sense. And so we had a log line and then like maybe like 2018, we turned it into like a, a script. And so we, you know, we over time just kind of slowly finessed it into something that was recognizable and 
you know, from there, kind of like a ship of Theseus where, you know, different production needs and things like that would make you tweak the script, you know, a money thing or something you see with the talent. So you never really kind of finish the idea until post is done, if that makes sense. So you, we, we, we had the idea for a while, but like it, the version that came out, you know, it's, has been tinkered with ever since, if that makes sense. No, yeah, for sure. And I think there's some real authenticity with the setting of the Glen. I just love this setting so much. And it kind of feels like an everywhere build. Like there's a part of every city in America that feels like the Glen. To me, it reminded me of parts of Jacksonville, like where my high school was. Um, to me, also maybe a bit of East Gainesville in there. But I want to ask you, where is the Glen for you? Like, where is your Glen? I mean, the Glen is home, man. Like, you know, like I'm, I'm from Tuskegee. I grew up in Montgomery. And so a lot of, uh, you know, just a lot of the location a lot of the personality, you know, comes from just being back home. You know, what I, mean? I think there's this quality of being lost in time that we, you know, kind of pursue with the production design and the tone. You know, a lot of things when I think about like Tuskegee, you know, you got the shopping center that was, you know, it used to have a Walmart and a Domino's. And then like the time I was a kid, it, it, the Walmart would have been replaced with like a Hobby Lobby and the Domino's mm. and the Pop. And then that got replaced with an even more bootleg version of the Hobby Lobby, you know. Mm. And so there's this like patina of like the 80s, even though, you know, you're in the 90s now, even then all of a sudden you're in the 2000s, you're in the aughts, you're in the 2010s and you still have this 80s patina on a lot of things. And so, yeah, I think it gives it, a lot of charm though you know in terms of like uh seeing evidence of things that you used to places you used to frequent you when you were in like elementary school and you could still see the shell of this you know one you know two screen movie theater in tuskegee it's like that's really charming you know what i'm saying i feel like a lot of times it's you use like old-fashioned and you know dated in a pejorative sense but i, I don't think it necessarily has to be and obviously when you have the fun with the conspiracy angle of you know when you're asking the question of like did this did we arrive at this organically or was this curated or is this by design I think that's just another element that we we could have fun by playing with like all these anachronisms and playing with this world that kind of felt like it was in a few different time places all at the same time so yeah there's a lot of alabama in it for sure jessica noted that all the license plates in the Glen read a swell place like you kind of left it uh, ambiguous like that what, what was the idea behind that yeah i mean i think you kind of say like any town usa i mean i think this the place they're in is very much like an archetype for whatever the your local equivalent is of you know uh, this type of neighborhood. You know what I'm saying? And so, you know, I, I, I always hesitate to say the ghetto because like that has so many connotations to it that are mm -hmm. that are negative. You know, we all know areas like this. You know what I'm saying? And I think like a lot of times you like assign you know these personality traits to the people that live in these areas even though you've never been there even though you might not know anybody there so you know i think like there's a reverence for you know these kind of communities that like you know that you're satirizing elements of it but at the same time you know hopefully by the time you get to the end of the movie you, you're also showing that these kind of neighborhoods have a little bit more than meets the eye making it making it feel archetypal you know what i'm saying making it feel like you know it's you have a everybody got an mlk street Every city got a MLK okay, street, you know what I'm saying? Like every every city got a neighborhood that probably reminds you, you know, somewhat of the blend. And so I was really kind of what we were going for. Yeah, it, I mean, it feels like a celebration of it. Like it, it, it's like the kind of place I'm like, it'd be fun to hang out there. Like I, I, I love that. Um, the and you had mentioned like that's where we start at the beginning of the movie is like on an advertisement, and we talked before we start recording about the the advertising the easter eggs and real quick i want to ask about like it seems like the opening exchange of the movies about michael jackson this kind of conspiracy theory that's like oh no he's black again and then i noticed later when we see the lab tech he's dancing to don't stop till you get enough was that an intentional nod to michael jackson like what the og fontaine well yeah i mean i think we were just having fun with foreshadowing kind of some of the more uh, weird things about the plot as you go in. You, mm -hmm. you have a, basically the Michael Jackson situation going on uh, on a macro scale, if that makes sense. I mean, we're spoiling stuff here, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. So, you know, the kind of wonky mm -hmm. master plan is basically like what happened to Michael Jackson on a, you know, on a mass scale, right? And so we just 
having fun, foreshadowing the <laughs> kind of some of the some of the turns that would come later. So you know, Michael Jackson was a black man who became a white man, and so why not why not start it with that? Because that's ultimately <laughs> that's ultimately where it's going uh, in terms of you know the nefarious plot, so to speak. Uh, and it, you know, it's like very much leaning into the conspiracy thriller angle of black exploitation and. I think, like you know, again, it's it's absurd, but you know, I think you want to have fun with it. You know, what I'm saying you can't be like ashamed of like the absurdity of this villainous plot. Uh, you got to kind of lean in. So that was just us leaning in. You know what I mean? I thought that was so good. I mean, I think it's something that like starts as a joke, but there is so much truth to that. And I think you throw it in there, and I look. Me growing up, I just grew up going through Publix and seeing tabloids about Wacko Jacko and how crazy he is. But like, this is the first time your movie made me look back at that and be like, holy shit, no, this guy was kind of warped by the Hollywood music industry, the studio system, and they they transform people. They make them crazy. So some people would say, you know, you got a contingent of people who say, was he crazy? You know what I mean? Like, they, right. <laughs> I mean. Not for me to say, because I don't know, him, but you know. What I'm yeah, <laughs> it's a complicated figure. We're not defending anyone. We're not, you know. <laughs> like we, we understand. I'm just saying. in there, like you know. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Here, yeah. 100% though, right? Like the apparatus does, you know, uh, it warps people, right? Like, and I think, uh, you know, there there are definitely some parallels between the Hollywood apparatus and how it, you know, <laughs> you get chewed up and spit out. Obviously, you know what I mean, uh, and so. There are definitely some parallels there. Everything in the movie seems to be part of like a reference to something and it just feels so specific and and coming from like, a, again, a place of authenticity. The phrase Olympia Black is something that a lot of people are kind of speculating about. Is it a reference to the sci-fi author? Is it a reference to Olympia Washington? What was your idea oh, behind that? It's funny. So a couple people have asked this and I always feel like I'm like, damn. So this ironically enough was like the one thing that gets asked about, like this gets asked about more than the Soma. And it's the one thing where it was a complete serendipitous coincidence, funny enough. So we didn't know about like my human pet until we were asked a question about it. It was like, what? Like because we we <laughs> we, we trying to find, you know, phrases that had like double meanings. We didn't like the ring of it, like in terms of just the way, just the phonetics in general. And it was like, Olympia Black, that got a nice ring to it. You know what I'm saying? So we we ultimately came back to Olympia Black, and ironically enough, of all the things that people like look for in terms of the Easter eggs, that's the word that I feel like mo- the most people looked, searched for and ultimately ended up finding an Easter egg in where I say that's the one that I wish we were smart enough to claim credit for that and say like, oh yeah, we definitely meant to do that. But that was actually a complete happy accident, um, which sounds unbelievable. But trust me, I, if I, I, would, I would claim it. I would like to, it. it would only make us look like we're actually smart if we had intended to do that. But that one was actually unintentional. But you know what's great about that is now people, when they watch the movie, they can kind of claim their own meaning about it. You just put like a little MacGuffin in there that will drive people crazy. They'll they'll come up with all kinds of stuff over the ages. This is on Netflix. Who knows who's going to be watching this in 50 years? Be like, Many people will never see these interviews where we say we, we, this was an accident and we'll think we just did it. Yeah. I love the twist. Uh, bringing in the OG Fontaine. Uh, and I I read in your interview with Hollywood Reporter how like the original idea, you know, we don't meet Tyrone until the end of the movie, but one idea was to make the character Frog the ty- uh, Tyrone. And then you were just gonna hide it in his costume and his makeup and everything like that. Mm-hmm. Can you talk us through your decision and the evolution of who was gonna be Tyrone in this movie? When we were developing it to pitch it, you know, so we, we pitched like, pretty detailed outline, you know. Um, so we, we pitched, it was a super long pitch, so we, we pitched um, basically every scene in the movie. Now, obviously, that was as it was in 2018, so it's not every scene in this version of the movie, but we knew from the beginning that Fontaine wasn't going to be Tyrone. So we knew whoever Tyrone is, he won't be the main character. That was just because we thought it was funny in the beginning. Right? So we was like, we'll, we'll be contrarians and, and, and make it make it somebody else. The natural next question is who organically you kind of, we kind of came to two people that it could be, you know, the first being like Frog in terms of explaining, you know, why does why is this 
wino at the liquor store like why is he the griot of, of this neighborhood so to speak you know uh it's like oh well obviously the an easy way to metabolize that is if he is you and he's seen everything that you're doing and he's, and he's been you know watching every iteration of him since you know since himself and so it, it that one was a you know we we had this scene where like he was going to take him out to a diner and they were you know like a restaurant um and, you know, treat him to lunch and buy him a meal and like get some of the spiel. And then, you know, it, it wasn't that big of a leap from there. Saying again, like if you're, if you're going back to like the root of it, like who would, who would the most logical person to be Tyrone? It's clearly OG, right? Like they cloned Tyrone. OG is Tyrone. They cloned him. They made many more. That felt like the lowest hanging fruit but the most interlocking curly Q story where everything kind of like connects very cleanly. That's the one that connects the cleanest. Like, he's Tyrone, mm -hmm. they cloned him, you know, you come back home to meet yourself at the end of the movie. But I don't know, there was also something that felt, for whatever reason, I think we still kind of had a feeling of like the fruit was, was right there. And like, it's like, can we get weirder? I think was the, the thought process is like, can it, can it be a little weirder than that? You know, and I think that's kind of where it started to, okay, what if it was just someone random? You know, it's like, okay. <laughs> but then, but then from that, you know, kind of almost like jokey throw out of, well, let's make him a random person. Then you start going, well, like, what are the ramifications of it being a random, random person? Like, where would this person be? Why would they have cloned him? And then all of a sudden you start expanding the world and like, well, technically, they could be, they don't have to just be in the group. And so now all of a sudden the scope of the entire operation starts to grow and you start to think of the apparatus and through a bigger lens, you know what I'm saying? And so now you're going like that, that, that is starting to inform the way we think about, you know, this iteration of MK Ultra. I mean, like we, we wrote a whole dossier that <laughs> goes through the history of MK Ultra and how it shuttered in the seventies and became MK Opera and like, you know, so you know, they, were, they went from make, trying to make battleships disappear and, and uh, wormwood yeah. and like, you know, midnight yeah. to try to like use LSD and they suddenly got more sophisticated. Like, you know, we wrote this whole like, you know, uh, dossier and we typed it in like uh, Courier and we redacted things. <laughs> it was like, you know, it was part of our pitch to actors actually. So we, we, uh -huh. we, we took this, we, we, we binded this folder and made a stamp and whole thing and we brought it to Jamie and like gave it to him and, but in that was a lot of the you know a lot of the world building that we, we started building out of as a this joke of just saying like let's make time on someone random all right well if he's random maybe he's not in the glen if he's not in the glen where is he okay he could be anywhere maybe they're everywhere like maybe you know what I mean and so this is all happening while you're developing the outline we haven't even written it yet right and so there's a bit of a cloud of associations that happen in the, you know, like in that first part of the process. So it's not a linear thing, right? Like you, we didn't necessarily like think like first scene all the way to the last scene. You're thinking about, you starting with Fontaine's journey, reverse engineering backwards from like, okay, so we know, we know we wanted to, you know, first he was going to meet the man and now it's like, okay, well, that, that doesn't necessarily tie in thematically with this question of blame and person's responsibility. Well, it doesn't take you long to get to meeting himself and so it's kind of hard to remember which the chicken or the egg in terms of like which elements came first you know what i mean but i think they were all kind of being thought of concurrently in, in the beginning stages so once you kind of know that the wizard of oz is yourself at the end of the movie i think he you know you're also concurrently trying to think of okay here's tyrone who makes the most sense who are we most excited about making Tyrone? And like, you know, obviously OG makes the most sense, but like we weren't the most excited about it. So we changed it, you know, so we decided not to make it that. And in doing that, I think, you know, that thought process opened up the, you know, the scale of the conspiracy. And so as opposed to being a standalone complex that they found and rooted out and finished by the end of the movie, you realize like it's a little more pervasive than you thought. So thinking back a long time so it's hard to go through like the exact thought process of how we landed there but that's no, yeah. how we got here for sure and Joel, i think i love hearing you talk about this because it's you're describing the creative process right it is it's not linear it is something to where it's just all, it just all existed in your head at some point uh or it just kind of evolved outwardly that way and i loved uh 
Love this idea of like, yeah, I think it was a brilliant decision to make Tyrone almost as like post credit figure because it makes him more of a universal figure. It's some something that could be happening in your town and it is happening in your town. It's not confined to the Glen, it's everywhere. And I love this idea of the blame versus responsibility and this chain of responsibility. I noticed something that you did throughout this movie is anytime you think it's the man behind the curtain. There's always another man behind the curtain. I mean, when Kiefer Sutherland shows up in this movie, I was like, holy shit, it's Lieutenant Kendrick from A Few Good Men. It's the Klansman from A Time to Kill. It's perfect casting for this movie. And even he reports to someone. And then you meet OG Fontaine and even he reports to someone and we never see oh, yeah. the ultimate man behind the curtain. And even the title of the movie is They Clone Tyrone. It's some other they. It's yeah. some other assholes 100%. who decided to do this. So ultimately, like, who do you want the audience to blame for what's going on? Is Do you yeah. want them to look at themselves, yeah. look at the government? We try not to answer that question. and Because well, the mm -hmm. question doesn't have a... Like, once you make it, it's in the universe, and now it don't belong to you anymore, right? So it's like, who I might think is responsible might not be who you thought was responsible when you were watching it. And so, you know, it, it feels presumptuous to assume that someone who's got a completely different background is me is going to watch it and, and, and take the same take the same thing away that I might take away when I'm watching it. And so it's like, obviously people have been interpreting it in different ways. And, you know, we, we went out of our way to present it as just a bootleg Scooby-Doo movie where, you know, <laughs> some, some, some ne'er-do-wells are solving a mystery that they have no business being on the, on the you know, the trail of. And hopefully you have a good time, you know, with this ratchet mystery movie and trying to remove the didacticism from it, right? And trying sure, to, yeah. You know, this is a treatise on, you know, X, Y, and Z, which, you know, it may, it may very well be, you know what I mean? But those elements of it may not be a part of everybody's dream experience, right? And so it's hard for me to say what someone should take away from it because it, it, it definitely, it definitely feels like they're gonna repeat. There's been people who just took away things that that I was like, hmm, I should have said that in the interviews. You know what I mean? Like, it's, <laughs> it's people who said things that was way smarter than, you know, much, much. They gave us way too much credit in a lot of ways. You know, like, oh yeah, that that's a very smart way to say that. I should start saying it the way this random person who watched the movie described it. Like they put it very well. Right. Like you know, I, I've seen that a few times. Just like people like hitting me up and sending me stuff and. You know, I think it's it's more gratifying to see how people interact with it organically. You know what I mean? And so it's I hesitate to say like they should take anything specific about it. Like again, like there's, there's stuff in there, there's food for thought if if you're so inclined. Uh, but you know, I think it's it's funner to let people kind of interact with it and draw their own views out of it. I think it means you've done your job as an artist, you know, like your job isn't to answer people's questions. It's just just to kind of frame the discussion. And the fact that people are responding so much to this movie, I think just speaks to to your talent as a filmmaker. I think you did an incredible job with this movie. I can't wait to see what you do next. I mean, could you do a Tyrone Cinematic Universe at this point? Because we have the L.A. chapter, which is its own story. The Tyrone Cinematic Universe is, is a Every movie would be a different, a totally different style of movie that that does not reference the movie that came before. That's what it would be. Uh, so the next one, they open, they open a pizza shop, they open a bakery, and it's just the three of them in a workplace comedy. We don't, we only refer to in the first two minutes, like you know, it's crazy what happened last week. Yeah, I know, right? And then you never talk about the fact that two of them are clones. You never talk about anything that happened, anything that's good. They just. They've got to get these pizzas, you know, <laughs> got to get these pizzas ready because the business is is, uh, is failing and they've got to figure out a new recipe for these pizzas, you know. That sounds great. I mean, that's that's what we need with these cinematic universes. It's not that they're all telling one story, that they're telling like different different stories that are all just kind of connected. It's a real universe, but... you know, it'd be a true universe, yeah. you know. It's, it's, yeah. It might just be Tyrone trying to, you know, Tyrone starts selling real estate, you know. And, <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> it's, just, you know awesome. it's just it's just that, you know. It's one man, one man against you know a uh, overpriced housing market, you know. I mean, yeah, that is the the next great evil that I think someone needs to <laughs> tear down. 
Okay, that was my conversation with Joel Taylor. As you can see, a very thoughtful, very talented person. We can't wait to see what he does next. Again, check out the full Easter egg breakdown on the main New Rockstars channel. Support all three channels of the New Rockstars network. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time on The Breakthrough.